Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm happy to uh, welcome you to our Outlib panel titled Illiberal Challengers of Liberal Democracy in Europe. Uh, what we will talk about today under this fairly broad title is going to be much more focused. We will zoom in on those political actors which we have seen rising, gaining ground, or just simply solidifying their hold on power in the recent European parliamentary elections, and those which may be lesser talked about in the broader uh, European uh, discussions, but are equally important and might actually gain ground in uh, upcoming elections in Austria and the Czech Republic. Uh, in that regard, we will zoom in on the appeal and potential impact of um, the Austrian Freedom Party uh, as the Austrian elections are coming up just next weekend. And we will also take a close look at the Czech ONU Party led by former Prime Minister Andrei Babiš. Um, this is to also show that illiberal challengers come in a variety of colors uh, with a variety of ideologies. And this is something that we in the Outlib project are trying to explore. Uh, Outlib, or uh, in its longer form, Neo-Authoritarianisms in Europe and the Liberal Democratic Response is a three-year horizon project funded by the European Union and UK Research and Innovation. It is led by the CEU Democracy Institute um, by Professor Joet Enyadi. Uh, in this project, we have the motto to protect the future of liberal democracy in Europe, one must first understand its challengers. And this is precisely what we are trying to do here, taking at closer looks on national level developments as well as on the European level. To do so, we have three excellent speakers joining us today who will help us make sense of this variety and its potential impact. Uh, we have with us here in person at the CEU campus in Budapest, Marlen Wind, who is a Danish political scientist um, specializing on the uh, interlinkages of law and politics in Europe. She is a professor of political science at the University of Copenhagen and the director of the Center for European Policy. Online, we have with us Lawrence Ensberg Jedanastik, professor of Austrian politics at the University of Vienna, who has been specializing on uh, parties, elites, and welfare state and social policy in the Austrian context. And we also have with us Petra Gasti, who is an associate professor at Charles University, focusing mainly on democracy and participation and inclusiveness in representative democracies. Uh, I also have to say that today's uh, discussion is recorded and is going to be shared online after uh, the Budapest Forum, which is hosting our panel discussion today. So without further ado, uh, I would pose my first question to Marlene uh, to give us a little bit of a context about the European scene. In the recent European parliamentary elections, we have seen a variety of populist Eurosceptic uh, political forces gaining ground. And although um, they have not really um, managed a breakthrough in the European Parliament, but we do see at least the stabilization of a strong far right uh, in the EP. In many cases, actually, these parties are in government by now. So they are becoming increasingly normalized. Yet we also see radical left forces rising in Europe. The recent um, elections, state elections in uh, Germany and Saxony and Thuringia are also a case in point. So my question to you would be, is it just the same old, um, do we see the same old actors now rising for some reason? And if so, what is their appeal? Or is there something qualitatively different about the illiberals of today 
uh, in the European context. Thank you very much, Susanna. Thanks for everyone to be here and uh, for inviting me to, to Budapest again. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I think you are right uh, in uh, saying that, um, that's, at least that's the narrative in Europe right now, that the, the, the center held uh, at the European elections. Uh, but unfortunately, um, as I see it at least, this is not enough. This is not, this is not enough to give us any kind of comfort because uh, as we have seen uh, recently in, uh, in Germany, um, uh, the uh, extreme right, but also the extreme left uh, in Saxony and, uh, and uh, Thüringen have, have uh, shocked the entire establishment of politics in Germany to such a degree that my, uh, my, my prediction will be that due to this internal um, rise of, of the extreme right and the extreme populist left, uh, we will for the next year in Europe see a complete paralyzed European Union. Uh, not only because of what's going on in, in, in Germany, uh, but you can clearly see that the German Chancellor uh, always got a nervous breakdown from seeing his own party go down and also see the coalition that he is heading uh, being um, discredited in these elections. So even though we are talking about some Eastern states that have always alluded to the extremes, um, this is a very, very dangerous moment right now in German politics. So going far beyond the, um, the European elections, what happens in the member states, uh, and, and Germany is not the only one, is something that tells us that a, a bigger transformation is, is actually going on. Uh, we normally teach our students that the German Friends Alliance is important for any progress in the European Union, and they are certainly important for the support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and, and I really fear that after this election in Germany, but also uh, the, the, the parallels of, of French politics that we have uh, equally seen since uh, the European elections where Marine Le Pen won uh, a landslide um, um, victory uh, and, and uh, you know, two, two months of, of, of no government in France um, is an indication um, that we are in a place right now uh, in Europe that is actually more dangerous than, than uh, it has been for many years despite the fact that if you, of course, count the numbers, you still have a center that is, is, is uh, in power in, in, in Brussels and in Strasbourg. Uh, but what is going on underneath is much more dangerous, I would say, than what we have seen. You also talked earlier, Susanna, about, and we'll hear more about that later, uh, 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 Austria. Uh, we have seen Meloni in, in Italy. Um, uh, we have um, uh, the, the Netherlands uh, with, with, with some big problems in terms of, of also um, an uh, extreme right government um, that is challenging and questioning the whole kind of philosophy of the European Union. Um, so, so I'm very fearful um, for what's happening and will be happening uh, in, in, in the EU uh, and in particular, of course, uh, when it comes to, to, to Ukraine and, and, how, uh, and how we are going to give full support to Ukraine in the coming uh, years. Uh, I'm quite sure Putin is very happy about what's happening. I think he is clapping in his small hands uh, for every single vote that goes to an extreme right or an extreme left party, because that is exactly what he wanted to achieve, disruption and uh, questioning of the values we stand for in Europe, and have been uh, standing for. So, so I think that, that this is, is, I wouldn't say I'm not a, a, a conspiracy theorist, uh, so I'm not going to, to sit here and claim that, that he has orchestrated everything, but there's certainly evidence that he has uh, both been trying to influence these results uh, and also been successful to do it. So uh, the only thing and it's not very uh, comforting what I'm, what I'm saying, uh, I, I know that. But the, the only thing that could make things even worse 
is of course if Trump wins the election. Uh, so so I don't know what balcony we're going to jump out, all of us, because uh, if that happens, then uh, yeah, I don't even want to think about it. But uh, but we are in I think in more dangerous times than uh, we have been for a long time when it was isolated countries that had governments that were problematic for the EU and populist, uh, authoritarian even, not, not liberal anymore, um, falling out of the category of liberal democracy. We are sitting in one of them. Um, I think that was, that was um, I wouldn't say it was handleable. It was, it was you know, possible to cope with this uh, for, for the EU. Um, but, but I think that having this undercurrent in all of Europe, also Western European countries, of, of the same kind of populism sneaking into all uh, areas of public life is really a very, very uh, serious warning to all of us who are somehow uh, in our work and in our academic work uh, trying to, uh, to, to defend uh, those values that make it possible, makes it possible for us even to sit in this room and have a discussion. Uh, precisely, and these are the values that also make it possible for some of these actors to eventually uh, rise and come to power. Uh, thank you very much, Marlene. Uh, moving on from this uh, not so optimistic uh, scene setting, which uh, is anyhow fairly typical of the panels that I sit on, uh, I want to now move to Lawrence. Uh, we have elections coming up in Austria next week. Uh, Austria is one of our focus countries of our outlet project within which we uh, explore illiberal actors uh, more closely in seven countries. But still I feel Austria is usually somewhat less talked about. Uh, could you please give us a little bit of an overview about uh, the main illiberal in this case, ideologically far-right actor, uh, the Freedom Party of Austria. Uh, what is the appeal uh, behind the party in the current context? And what are your expectations for uh, next week's elections? Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, all, the, all the water that came down prevented me from going to Budapest, but um, I'm happy to to join you online here. So we're we're about to have elections uh, to the Austrian parliament uh, next, or like the Sunday after the next. And uh, the FPÖ is on track to be the strongest party for the first time since 1945. The FPÖ is actually a quite old party, was founded in the 1950s and had like mostly, uh, like for decades wasn't really like marginal party, but then was basically making a move towards a more populist style of politics and also mobilizing on some uh, like more modern or new issues like immigration from the 90s onwards and became extremely successful in that course and has been a member of the Austrian government four times so far and it's possible not the most likely outcome in my view, but possible that it will also be a part of the next government. Um, so the most uh, relevant issues for FPÖ to mobilize are, is, are of course, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment. There's also COVID that still lingers in the background. COVID was an, a very, very polarizing issue in Austria. Austria was one of the only countries in the world that like actually uh, at least passed by law a vaccine mandate, even though it was never implemented and later scrapped. Um, but COVID was really a gift for the FPÖ in terms of mobilizing people that it maybe hadn't previously reached. And it, of course, also was the only party to strongly take like a... Um, a an, like or like take a very unsupportive position towards Ukraine in, in the Russian invasion. And another issue that 
is a bit under the radar, but it has become extremely important for mobilizing uh, or at least differentiates FP voters strongly from many other, from actually all other voters is uh, severe skepticism or, or um, rejection of climate protection measures. Uh, so immigration, COVID, Ukraine, climate, those are four of the central uh, issues, plus, of course, a generic e European Union skepticism. Um, what we can also say about the party at the moment is that while in previous elections, or in the run-up to previous elections, it had tried to moderate and adapt somewhat to like the mainstream, that is now absent. So previously, the party had tried to appeal more to, to potential coalition partners and also appear more like ready for government and for like put on a more statesman-like uh, uh, rhetoric and, and appearance. And that is not at all happening at the moment. So there's no visible signs of moderation on the part of the party. Uh, which may have to do with the fact that it's on track to be the strongest party and may therefore like claim to lead the government and not only enter it as a junior coalition partner as it has done in the past. So for the post-election government formation process, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, the pivotal party in this is not going to be the FPÖ because there's only one party that would ever enter a government together with the FPÖ. That's the Christian Democratic ÖVP. And it's most it's mostly on them to decide what the what shape the next government will will uh, look like, even though they are on track to lose a large share of their voters uh, after five years in government. And they are now, um, but they will still be the pivotal party and it probably will depend on their calculations and whether they can see a way forward with the FPÖ or would prefer a coalition with other parties where they could maybe still be the leading party in government, which is always attractive. So it's a little uncertain what the outcome of this, or it's actually quite uncertain what the outcome of this election in terms of government formation will be, but it's clear that this be a, going to be a massive strengthening of the FPÖ. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And uh, it's very interesting what you're saying about the lack of uh, moderation in this electoral campaign, which um, I think is also very much in uh, line with the uh, pan-European trend that characterizes, of, uh, characterizes the far right. But we can look even further to the United States, uh, which Marlene mentioned before. We definitely see a complete lack of uh, moderation there. Um, Lawrence, you mentioned that uh, some of the uh, issues that FPÖ mobilizes on are immigration, uh, climate skepticism, which might be something actually new, and maybe we come back to this later, but also uh, COVID. And essentially, um, these are topics which challenge the incumbent government um, and their governance. Um, so on this note, I wanted to turn to Petra and ask you uh, to put the Czech illiberals into a little bit of uh, context for us. Because yes, I said that some of these topics are challenging the incumbent, but still in the case of FPU, we see a clear far-right ideology. That's not so in the case of Anno and Babish. So what is it that uh, the Czech illiberals can really tap into and what characterizes them? Thank you and uh, hello everybody. I'm sorry I'm not in a beautiful, beautiful Budapest, but we have a lot of water on, on railways throughout the throughout the country and I'm happy that I can be here. So what Anno exemplifies is the hybrid nature of populist movements that blur traditional left-right divides. In fact, uh, Andrei Babish calls himself a catch-all party. I have no idea uh, which of his advisors 
recommended this to him, but basically he presents himself as party for everybody. The party instead focuses on personal leadership, tapping into voter frustration with traditional political structures. The ANO strategy appeal, I would say, rests on four pillars, and these will be very, I think, detectable across Europe for similar parties, but also one, I think, is different. What is similar is the performative strong leadership. So this is a party which has very few members, which is very, the leader has a super strong hold. There are basically almost no internal democratic, uh, democratic uh, mechanism. Then the second, which I think is very common, is the anti-establishment rhetoric. So despite uh, Babish's own involvement in politics and business. He effectively portrays himself as an outsider, as a, disrup uh, as a disruptor, as somebody fighting the corrupt elites. And he's echoing in this way the core populist sentiments. What's, uh, what's different is, I would say, economic uh, pragmatism, or I call it chameleonic nature. So basically, as the party does not have any clear ideology, it just follows. Uh, it just uh, follows uh, follows public sentiment. So basically, if you ask where does uh, where does Anno stand on a policy X, you just need to look into public opinion and see where the majority is, and that will be the Anno. That will be the Anno position. I think uh, what Anno has managed to do over time is to solidify base, which mostly relies on senior citizens. And I think this is something we should be watching for across Europe as traditional parties decline. They were able to kind of create a coalition programmatically between for all generations. And this generational divide is something that really uh, keeps me keeps me up awake because Europe is aging. We have uh, demographic we have demographic decline, and and I think uh, this is going to be further, let's say, threats on which these illiberal leaders can pull to see how strong. Uh, representative democracy will hold uh, will hold together. So I would say certain economic pragmatism is something I would add there. And finally, what I think is uh, also no longer unique to unique to unique to Babish is this uh, technocracy. So depolitization of politics. He is uh, not inviting people to uh, part to be active participants, uh, to be active citizens. On the contrary, this is audience democracy. What Nadia Urbinati would call it in in her amazing book, uh, Democratic Disfiguration. Disfigurations. This is telling people, I will take care of it for you. You just uh, you just give me the votes, and uh, and I'll be there. I'll be there for you. I just want to, in reaction to Lawrence, maybe say a small point why Anno can not really go into the anti-vax because Anno governed during the during the pandemic. So they are actually trying to make this uh, a non-topic as much as possible. And its biggest challenge, uh, it's Anno's biggest challenge in the next year's parliamentary elections is actually finding a coalition partner to govern with. And these probably will be, uh, for now, fragmented populist radical right, but we are seeing a certain consolidation also thanks to their success in the European parliamentary elections. We have actual elections in three days in Czech Republic. There was some debate whether we should hold them or not, but I think the Czech state has the capacity to hold elections even, even with, uh, with, uh, with floods. And that's going to be about uh, whether Anno will succeed uh, uh, more in uh, in the regional in the regional governments where there was so far a strong cordon sanitaire against uh, against uh, its uh, its hold on on power. We are also seeing a bit of a shift in strategy. And final word, what I would like to say is. Uh, that this chameleonic policies, I mean, they are not without direction. And we are seeing increasingly, especially on the issue of Ukraine and migration, flirting of Anno with uh, nationalism and uh, and nativism. And that can be actually pondering to, so we are actually seeing radicalization of Anno in, in view of potentially coalescing with uh, with the with successful populist radical right parties. 
Thank you, Petra. And this last point is uh, extremely interesting and might also explain why uh, Anno actually uh, joined the Patriots for Europe in the European Parliament. Uh, and maybe um, this is something that we can also return to a little bit later, what is in store for the party later on, whether it needs to adopt a sort of um, ideology that informs uh, its positions and therefore might reduce its chamele chameleonic nature or whether that's not necessary. Um, but on the policy point, uh, Petra pretty much said that the policy of ANO goes where the people are. Um, this might be less so in the case of FPU, which does have an ideological core. It's a nativist far-right party. Uh, and Lawrence, you have previously studied the impact of FPU on various policy domains. Should the party uh, manage to enter government or maybe even lead government after these elections, what are your expectations? How would FPU impact policies in Austria and whether the party would go further? Would it impact the polity? Would it impact the quality of democracy, not just in terms of uh, values of uh, pluralism, protection of minorities, which I'm assuming it would, as it did before, but would it actually uh, affect the institutions behind democracy as well? Could it do so? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the areas that I would watch most closely if the FPÖ ended up in government would be asylum policy, of course. That's a like that's a given, basically. Uh, if we look at what's happening in Germany, also in the Netherlands, with the announcements recently, so I would I would strongly assume that the FPÖ would would chart a course that would also like follow these examples. I think we should also probably assume that we will see uh, social policies that where the FBI has in the past, together with the EVP, tried to implement welfare chauvinistic measures, uh, th that to be taken up again. All these attempts failed in the past because of constitutional or European law constraints, and, and we can talk, talk about those, but I would assume that they will try again. Uh, some other measures that could be, or like some other policy areas that could be affected is, of course, all all the measures um, that have in the past few years been taken uh, against climate change. So we now had a relatively active government, although it was like quite controversial, but, but a lot of activity on climate policies, given that a Green Party was the junior coalition partner. Um, and I would also assume that uh, in terms of um, internal security policies, uh, uh, like police rights uh, and, and those things that the FPÖ would try to be very active. I think the FPÖ would also, uh, so w w one of its core policy pro policy proposals, like more of a, like institutional change or constitutional change proposals is to introduce a basically Swiss style system of a popular initiative that could we we already have popular initiatives but they would try and make uh referendums mandatory from a certain threshold that was actually already in the coalition agreement when the fp was in, in government last time but then like there was this video from a spanish island that like uh everybody has seen that kind of thwarted the whole process um and uh but I would strongly uh, suspect that this will be on the agenda again. So a much more like direct democratic circumventing parliament, giving basic legislative powers to uh, to voters directly. This is something that could only be implemented in Austria after a referendum, ha like after two thirds of uh, like MPs in parliament have agreed to it and a referendum has also been passed. So the hurdles are quite high for this. And I think it's unlikely to actually happen, but it will be certainly something that they will try. 
I also think we should look out for some of the core areas of the state, like the police, the intelligence agencies that have been under strong pressure and have been really um, by party actors, but also by Russia, like uh, become undermined to some extent, uh, to, to the extent that they need to be completely overhauled. And I would strongly assume that the FBI will try to curtail the uh, public broadcast in Austria. So specific media outlets would be under under attack or under 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 severe pressure, I think. That may also be true of schools and universities to some degree, for instance, in, in the election manifesto, if we proposes that there should be like a reporting office for teachers at school who kind of do undue politicizing in the in classes. And they also want to fight like gender mania and re the allegedly repressive climate at universities. This is somewhat unspecific, but yeah, may, uh, it's, it's unclear whether there's like any specific policies behind that or whether it's mostly rhetoric at the moment. So I think we have some institutional, we, we like the FPÖ as it is constituted now definitely envisages a completely different way of running a democracy. So a much more direct demo democracy based, a much more popular democracy with fewer institutional safeguards, also less power for courts. They have like a chapter in their manifesto that says explicitly, we have to curb the power of the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights uh, so that Austria becomes more sovereign again. And I think even though this becomes difficult to envisage how they will actually do this, I think they will try and go into open confrontation with the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights. And so I think we could just see a lot of pressure on the uh, on the judicial constraints that actually safeguard some of the individual rights and, 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 and minority rights. Uh, in Austria. So I would strongly assume that they would try and push against these constraints. Thank you very much, Lawrence. <clears throat> it seems that we do have a full menu, both in terms of policy and uh, potential institutional changes. Uh, one thing that caught my attention, or, uh, one of the many things that caught my attention uh, in your contribution is this mention of um, uh, lobbying for uh, referendums and uh, tools of direct democracy. Now, we hear that in the Czech Republic from um, a similarly far-right actor, uh, SPD, uh, of uh, Tomio Okamura, but not so much from AMO and uh, would not really fall in line with what you have been mentioning, Petra, about the technocratization uh, of politics, of, of governance in the case of Babish. Um, although elections on the national level are still a bit further off. Um, how do you see Ono's challenge to democracy as such uh, in the Czech Republic? How would it compare to that broad menu that Lawrence just have uh, described in the case of Austria? Yeah, thank you. So I will try to be. I will try to be brief. I would say the challenges are uh, the challenges are four: personalization of power. So I think even if uh, and I will I will get to I will get to SPD after I name this four. So personalization of power, conflict of interest. Andrei Babish is the largest recipient of EU funds uh, in or his companies are, which he claims are not his whatever. Agrofert is one of the largest uh, recipients of EU subsidies and also national also national uh, national funds. I think also this performative uh, nature of uh, of technocratic uh, of technocratic governance dissent uh, and let's say distaste for democratic checks and balances which are regarded as obstacles to effective to effective governance and are presented as presenting as such including this year that was a new thing attack on the constitutional on the constitutional uh, court i think also erosion of uh, erosion of democratic uh, democratic norms going back to uh, before i compare them 
like what is uh, what is the difference between between populist uh, radical right and maybe ano i mean the comparison would be ano's ideological flexibility versus populist radical right exclusionary nationalism institutional subversion in the hands of ano more than overt authoritarianism which lawrence has painted a, a terrifying picture of corruption and ideology and oligarchy against ideological extremism of the of the populist radical right i also think that uh, actually when you uh, Zhuzha men mentioned patriots uh, the patriots i think it's two things are interesting who joined and who was preventing from joining. And uh, this is part of a two-level game par excellence. It's a domestic play. So uh, for a long time, SPD has fan, uh, of Tomio Okamura populist radical right has fancied itself as a potential partner, but he is not the desired partner. There are others. There are more new new elements on the populist, uh, on the populist radical, on the populist radical right which are for now fragmented, but uh, there are actually efforts as we speak by the former president Miloš Zeman to unify and Václav Klaus. So two former presidents are joining uh, joining power to kind of bring these uh, bring these elements uh, bring these elements together as a potential junior partner for Babish and what they are hoping for and I think they have been succeeding so far if I look at the preferences is to basically cannibalize SPD with uh, offering similar offering similar uh, policy agenda but by different uh, subjects and those would be the coalition partners for uh for uh for Babish. So I think uh, here we are seeing also what actually can prevent it. Coalition politics. I mean this is not just about governance. When we speak about governance in our countries, it's it's coalition governments. And in coalitions you need to you need consensus. And I think any coalition partner Andre Babish ever had paid a very dear Price of being uh, of being cannibalized, and actually Tomio Kamura never even became it, and he skipped the part of being a partner to just being cannibalized, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is ongoing. So, so I thought that is interesting. And finally, I would just like to say, I mean, this is something we we are we are uh, we are seeing, and where I see a big difference between populist radical right and this technocratic offer of ano it's a different form of politics while the let's say populist radical right is trying to subvert the protection of minorities this is what all the policies uh, lawrence has mentioned have in common is actually that they're minority protections and so this is at the heart of representative liberal democracy is that the majority rules, but minority is protected. And by direct democracy, it's just dismantling another form. So every of this policy is just weakening minority protection in the name of majority rule. This is not what Andrei Babish is offering. He's offering he will govern for everybody. He's even asking all offering parties to like, just bring me your points. I will, I will implement them, bring me your policies, but I will be the one who will who will implement them and i think this is a a very dangerous form of politics uh, that just creates uh, you know state as a firm thank you very much petra uh, as i'm listening to you uh, i cannot help but think that some of the um let's call it instruments of uh capturing power uh, really resonate with what we have been observing also in Hungary, except in the case of Hungary, in the case of Fidesz, we do have also the additional layer of ideology. But the tactics, the uh, instruments are very, very similar. Um, and I would follow up along these lines with a question towards Marlene, and uh, knowing that uh, you are also uh, studying the role of institutions, uh, particularly uh, courts in, uh, in uh, safeguarding democracy uh, at the intersection of, of uh, law and politics. Um, how do you see this new wave of illiberals um, tackling that? Um, 
safeguard that would still be in place in um, the form of courts, in the form of institutions. Is there a challenge, again, what I previously was also hinting at, somehow fundamentally different? And uh, what fuels their success, actually, in this regard? Because they do seem to be uh, successful with their fundamentally majoritarian uh, ideas. Well, thank you very much, Susanna. Um, I think if, if I can, I just comment on some of the stuff that has been said. Um, I, th I think that sometimes uh, those of us who are academics and look at these movements, we, we have a tendency perhaps to, to botanize. I don't know if that's the right word in English, but you, you, you get too many uh, details and then you start um, focusing on all the differences instead of elevating yourself up in the helicopter and looking down at what's actually going on. Because I actually think there are many more commonalities uh, uh, than there are differences. If, if you look at the literature on populism, uh, there was a time when everyone said, it's the economy stupid. It's disadvantaged people. If people feel disadvantaged or don't like uh, uh, globalization, uh, they will turn to populism. And, and of course, what we can see here is it's prosperous countries we are talking about. So, so that narrative doesn't work anymore. So, so now it's culture stupid. It's not uh, uh, economic stupid, it's culture stupid. And what do I mean when I say that? Uh, I, I wrote about it in my book, The Tribalization of Europe, that came out uh, a few years ago, uh, where I explain how Orban had used culture in, in, in many different ways, it doesn't have to be, you know, it, it, it's a mix of oligarchism with, with uh, you know, uh, immigrants, with uh, vogueism. Um, it's, it's, it's a design policy. There was a book coming out a few years ago called The Spin Dictators. And, and I think that what sort of, what is, what they have in common, all these v different varieties if you talk, as you talk about in your project uh, diff different kind of versions of populism is that they are designed from above so whether you have the austrian version the czech version the slovak version the hungarian version even the danish version the uh, 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 version from from italy it's all designed uh, from the top with a uh, well-educated uh, people who are constantly uh, commending, now you should suggest this because now the, the people's sentiment goes in this direction, now you should suggest that, and then constantly monitoring the public debate and also designing the public debate and the narratives. It's different in different countries, but I think it's very dangerous if we as, as academics start to um, Instead of seeing this, uh, then start to to focus too much on the differences because what what they are really doing is the same. It's is cynical, top down, uh, building up of of. Uh, it's a little bit what what Putin is also doing to to Western Europe, that he is designing these stories. He is polarizing. He is uh, suggesting, offering uh, easy solutions to things. Uh, so it's different in different countries, but I still think that it's this top-down using misinformation, disinformation, uh, cornering certain types of, of, of actors, people, minorities, and so on. So, so I, I just want to warn that, that, that we, have to, we have to really, really uh, also uh, focus on the commonalities and the strategies that are used uh, by by these uh, different oligarchic populists uh, who who have one thing in common they want power uh, and they want to sit on the economy and the way to do that is sometimes to come up with a narrative about vogueism or immigrants or uh, more uh, no more referenda or whatever because referenda of course is is obviously very very nice right so you can pretend that you want to listen to the people uh, uh, nobody will check whether you actually do what the people want afterwards but you can at least have this narrative that you listen to the people now just to come back to your um question about the courts because that's something i have uh, i have a, 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 a certain um affinity too because i think uh, that if you look at the constitutionalist literature um, academic literature you have actually also among constitutional lawyers have a certain 
um, surge of populism. What do I mean by that? It's a very, very big uh, chart to come up with here. If you look at a book like that came out in 2022 uh, by Martin Lachlan called uh, Against Constitutionalism, what is that book really about? Um, it's saying, and people like Joe Weiler at the NYU, he supports this argument. It's a lot of lawyers who you used to see as supportive of constitutional democracy, of balance of powers, of courts to protect minorities, and so on. All of a sudden, all of these academics say that, all right, it's been too much with all these courts uh, since the Second World War, with all the courts wanting to decide about national policies. Uh, we should give power back to the people. We should give power back to the majority in parliament. Can you imagine? This is really crazy, if you ask me. So we have, on the one hand, a group of scholars since the Second World War who said we need strong courts to balance the parliament. That's what we've learned in school, right? That this is the way it should be. And now within the past, I would say, five, ten years, we have more and more scholars, uh, in particular legal scholars, who are all of a sudden turning around and saying, oh no, now we see in Poland and Hungary that people have had enough. <coughs> people have had enough of courts who overrule what the parliament really wants. It's, it's crazy, right? It's, it's amazing that we are seeing even among solid academics from London School of Economics, from NYU, from many other corners. I, I have written a paper about it. Uh, I hope it comes out soon. Um, uh, I call it populist constitutionalism. And, um, and, 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 and that is, uh, on top of everything empirical that is going on in all kinds of directions, and we see the populism everywhere, it's an undercurrent, it's, it's pushing to the establishment as well, because the establishment, look at Germany, now they are imposing border control, they are probably going to do a lot of other initiatives, um, uh, but, but on top of all the empirical, we also had this kind of normative, argument that um, it was simply too much to have all these courts decide over the parliament and now we should go back to the old philosophy of majoritarian democracy of having the people decide because in the end the people are the the you know the majority is the true representation of the people and therefore um, uh, the courts are elitist they are non-elected they should not be sitting either at the national level that's the argument um, neither at the la national level should we have too strong constitutional courts and too strong judges uh, and nor on on the eu level and at the of course strasbourg level so it's not just an empirical, that's my point, it's not just an empirical, an, an empirical phenomenon. We are also in the academic Western debate seeing this kind of search of anti-constitutionalisms, uh, anti-constitutional um, um, yeah, democracy, uh, and, and, and sort of a trend going back to majoritarian democracy where it's the majority who decides. It can either be uh, more referenda, uh, but but it can also be the, the 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 kind of the majority elected for parliament. It doesn't even have to be a majority government. It can just be the majority in parliament should never be overruled by uh, a court outside the parliament saying this is wrong. Because if there's a majority behind it, uh, then who is a court non-elected judges to say that that is not fine? I mean, actually, you may not believe it, but <laughs> Scandinavia, where I come from, um, has always been anti-constitutionalist. We have never had judicial review. We have never had courts stepping down on what the parliament uh, uh, wants. So, so a lot of, of, of uh, politicians in the Scandinavian countries, they are looking out in Europe and saying, wow, they are somehow copying us. Uh, but they are not really aware that this is actually a potentially quite populist way mm -hmm. of, of running democracy. In particular, if you look at 
Second World War and what happened after the Second World War, where the decision was, because of the Holocaust, we need to have a checks and balances. We need to have powerful institutions to keep uh, the majority in check. Uh, that never happened in Scandinavia and the UK neither. Um, so in, in our part of the world, it was always, you know, uh, no, 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 we don't want courts to interfere in what the people wants. Uh, and, and, and it was a very natural thing that 20 years ago, um, the Danish People Party in Denmark, which assimilates a lot of, of what you're talking about in, in, in your different countries, they had a huge uh, win. Uh, and uh, what happened? Uh, nobody questioned, oh, wow, okay, yeah. So they got very popular. Then it's natural that they uh, didn't come into power, but they became part of the right-wing coalition where they propped up the, 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 uh, the government. And, so, so, and, and there was nobody questioned it because it's been part of the political culture that the majority is always right. And I see tendencies in the constitutional literature these years that there is a going back to this, I would say, pre-war approach to politics that if that's what people want, then we should not start uh, picking uh, certain elements and saying you're not allowed to have this opinion, Just, you should be allowed to, to, to do what you want because in a democracy uh, it's not about the rule of law, it's mainly about deciding uh, for yourself what you want and if that's what a majority wants then you know the, the the judges should stay back and not interfere so so i see some some broader tendencies in in the world uh and um and and it's it's quite i think it's quite frightening that that we are having this debate right now that it's not only something happening in, happening on the ground in different versions in different countries but is also sort of starting to emerge as an academic discussion mm -hmm. and 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 no one is really challenging this it's just it's just happening and it's even among the most respected legal scholars out there thank you very much marlene and um it's it's extremely interesting because we started out with discussing some of our usual suspects, political parties, illiberal political parties challenging liberal democracy. And we are ending on a note of uh, intellectuals actually fueling that very type of challenge, which illiberal parties then very much tap back into. We do see that trend as well. Uh, we are not ending on a positive note, uh, and given the severity of uh, the challenge, I don't mind that. Uh, we have one minute of our scheduled time left. Uh, I would like to take one or two questions from the audience, not to let you leave without uh, audience participation. Uh, and then we will unfortunately need to wrap up uh, our conversation if there are questions in the audience. Do we have an additional? Thank you. And uh, please introduce yourself and also I would like to uh, point out the difference between a question and a comment. Thank you given the time pressure. So, uh, I, can you hear me? So I am Ben Tabari of uh, CUDI, and I would like to ask um, a question regarding something that I found really interesting as a comment during the presentations, uh, that is of the generational divide as a factor when it comes to populist mobilization, because I think, to my knowledge, in certain contexts, this does come up, whether there is like a correlation between usually senior citizenship and related viewpoints and support for authoritarianism. But these are usually like, let us say, like the context of Czechia and Hungary, but I don't know anything of the Western context, like in this regard, whether it's also a factor there, whether it's like, you know, it has its certain specificities, why, you know, older or actually younger people vote for these parties. So I would like to like, you know, invite the speakers to answer to this question. Thank you very much. And if there is anybody else, then uh, I would take one more question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Balint Mikola. I'm uh, also from uh, the CU Democracy Institute uh, and uh, a part of the Outlip project, and I especially enjoyed uh, this panel. Uh, and I would like to ask uh, that, so here we are discussing uh, illiberalism in, in, in Europe, and uh, one interesting mismatch I, I often find when, when we try to identify these parties is that few of them actually use the illiberal label themselves. And um, is that a mismatch between uh, political reality and academic discussions, or is it a mislabeling exercise, or, or, or what's going on? Are these parties really illiberal, or is it how we see them? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, turning to our panel, who would like to pick up one or the other uh, question? I would maybe uh, start with our online panelists first, if you would like to jump in. Can Petra. I? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the. Thank you for the questions. I will say on the on the generational on the generational divide i think it has uh, has to do i mean in terms of value orientations i want to make an important caveat and that is that in in many of these surveys uh, and in many of these analyses the young people we stop too early in my opinion because being critical of representative democracy does not for me mean that you want authoritarianism so I think that, uh, you know, the way to save democracy is actually more democracy, no less. I would not necessarily go the road of uh, direct democracy for, for the reasons I, I mentioned in the, previous, uh, in the previous intervention. So I think that we are cutting, uh, we are being too strict with the, with the young people. But of course, we, I think there are worrying trends. To, to watch for, and I think some of the democratic reforms that are more inclusive, such as lowering uh, voting age, this is some of my some of my favorite uh, things to do. We have seen uh, we have seen it in in Austria. We are seeing it in other we are seeing it in other countries. And in terms of uh, in terms of illiberalism in response to Balint, I mean, I think Balint there will be books written on that. Um, and the answer, as typical for a political scientist, is it depends. There, there are some that love to embrace this, and that's uh, most, uh, most uh, of all, uh, Orban Victor, who who has this program. But and and some of it is uh, simply our is simply our uh, our analysis. And if I may, just uh, one small point. I I want to echo what uh, Marlene has said, and I think we are living in the times of Carl Schmidt. And I think uh, I would invite the audience to to go and reread Carl Schmidt because a lot of these uh, a lot of these elements we are seeing. You will see there clearly, and you will know what to look for when you are when you are analyzing when you are analyzing politics, because this is a this is an agenda which uh, which Carol Schmidt has been has been pushing in the 30s, and we have seen where it uh, where it ended and why the courts were necessary necessary safeguard to protect uh, to protect actually all of us, because all of us in a certain aspect of our personality are a minority. And uh, and so, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Petra. Lawrence, please. Yeah, quite uh, quite briefly. So the age the age gradient in uh, in voting behavior in Austria doesn't affect the FPÖ so much. All the voters vote more for the two major parties or the erstwhile major parties, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, more so than younger parties, uh, younger voters, but. Uh, the FPÖ doesn't have a really strong age gradient in its in its support profile. Um, with respect to liberalism, the FPÖ the, the F in FPÖ stands for freedom, and it's it's called the Freedom Party of Austria, uh, and it used to be part of the Liberal International until the nineteen eighties. Uh, the parties like. Of course, it's a conflicted story. So the party manifesto that I've quoted a few times now has the weird title of Fortress of Liberty, which is kind of a contradiction in itself, but that's sort of their that's sort of their their, their uh yeah, that I think that sums it up quite nicely. Uh so I think the party has sort of a liberal tradition, which is now buried and gone mostly, but it would never endorse the illiberal label. 
uh, it would rather it it wouldn't also like use the term liberal to describe itself, but it would paint itself as like defenders of freedom and liberty, which of course, well, whatever that means, uh, those those liberties and and freedoms are of course like limited to a specific set of people and to a specific uh, group in the population. And it indeed does. Uh, formulate its policies uh, in, in that way, uh, targeting those freedoms to a very specific <laughs> group of people. Uh, Marilyn. Thank you. I, I was fearing you wouldn't like, give me the word. Of course I would. <laughs> the, the final word, because I really want to answer this. Um, actually, um, I think that uh, um, the, the, the question about the labeling of illiberalism, uh, what, uh, a very famous, I'm sure you know her, Kim Lane Schiepler, is she's very uh, well known here in Hungary. Uh, she, she has done a lot of studies showing that the modern type autocrat, they pretend on the surface to have all the institutions of a liberal democracy. They would never take a, a court away. They would they would never take a parliament away. They would never uh, say they didn't have media or, or civil society. What they do is something different. They, they pack them with their friends. But on the surface, if you came from another planet, landed in Hungary, you would say, ah, click the box. They have a parliament, great. Click the box, they have a, a court, great, no problem. Click the box, there are people in the street, they don't look afraid. Uh, so we have a civil society uh, and click the box to, 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 to the media uh, without looking into the substance of what's actually going on. So, so I think it's very, very important. These labels are not very interesting. What is interesting is what's going on and, and how the practices are, 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 um, um, are carried out. Uh, and and the Franken state was one of the articles she wrote, uh, Kim Lane Schiepler, showing that you are you can be perfectly uh, you know you can look uh, perfectly uh, liberal, uh, but but the way and it's we've seen the same in 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 uh, in, in Poland uh, during the peace uh, government, uh, but under the surface uh, it's it's not it's not you know, uh, of course, a real a liberal, it's rather illiberal. And that's also, in my opinion, the, one of the reasons why the EU has, has been so long about addressing both Poland and Hungary. Uh, fortunately, Poland is, is on the right track, or we hope so, uh, right now. Uh, we still don't know, but it's, it's on the way. Uh, but I think one of the reasons why the, 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 the European Commission has had such a hard time over the past 10 years 15 years almost now addressing uh, Orban, is that, you know, on the surface, it all looks right. Uh, and according to the treaties, you need to live up to the Copenhagen criteria, you sign up to the Article 2 and so on, but there's no check on the actual material praxis of being a democracy. And that is one of the big problems uh, in, uh, in Europe, in my opinion, that we have not uh, developed a qualitative um, I could talk about this for hours because uh, I have also looked into how the European Court of Justice by taking more and more cases about uh, judicial independence and so on that the court is gradually forced to define what is not just a liberal democracy or constitutional democracy but also how should how how to what degree a uh, is a court independent when the judges are appointed in this and that way? These kind of cases are coming now to the court and it's going to be very interesting because that will tell us uh, something about how the court may be able to develop some instruments to actually uh, not only challenge the usual suspects in the room, but, but my country as well because in my country, formally, as in Germany as well, uh, it's the uh, it's either the politicians or the majority in parliament or the uh, minister of justice who appoint the judges. So, so uh, uh, I think that that is very important. The, the 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 labels are not are not that important, but the 
discussion is really interesting. And then just very briefly about the generational thing, at least in, in Germany with the AFD, uh, it was a big success among the young. The young just loved them, and in particular the young men. Uh, and I think it's we are back to something uh, Donald Trump like, <laughs> you know, with, oh, he's a strong man, he's great, he's efficient, he's a strong man. I think they just like that. I mean, uh, uh, and, and they just like their disruption and then just like someone who is uh, pulling, uh, pulling some jokes off. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so I think it's, it's very difficult to generalize about whether young people are more uh, likely to be, to be, to be authoritarian or, or not. At least it, it counters all the literature, all what we have learned, that it's the older generation who likes this most and so on. And the AFD, it was the young people who gave them 30% of the vote. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting uh, point, and I cannot answer why, but... Um, well, but it yeah. seems we are not yeah. even safe from no. the young people anymore. Um, yes. Uh, lots of interesting points, and uh, I would really love to hear uh, more from all three of you, but unfortunately, we need to wrap things up. Um, I'm really grateful for all three of you who have joined the panel and also uh, our audience here uh, at Nador Utsa in Budapest, at Budapest Forum. Uh, I'm very glad that we have been able to show some of the varieties of illiberalism, but also some of the commonalities of illiberalism and the practice that we need to pay attention to. Because we see more and more that despite the variation, the practice travels, and that might be something that hopefully not, but that we might be seeing also in the United States. Uh, it's certainly in already uh, the pages of Project 2025, just to give an outlook beyond uh, Europe. So thank you once again, all of you for being here. Uh, those of you who are here on the spot, I encourage you to pick up some of our flyers and visit our uh, website. Those of you who will be watching us online, I also invite you to visit us at outlib.eu, that is A-U-T-H-L-I-B dot E-U, where you can find out more about our work on illiberalism and how to potentially, hopefully, counter that in Europe. Thank you very much for being here with us today. <laughs>